Hello there and welcome. We are still at Valet Pro in New Haven and we're joined by here Josh, the Valet Pro chemist, um, in your domain, in your chem yeah. lab. Um, now Josh, you are a proper bona fide chemist, you're not just a young bloke wearing some safety goggles. Yeah, so I went to university, did a masters in chemistry, uh, had a background doing hard surface cleaning products for in the kitchen, so mm -hmm. antibacterial, uh, degreasing products, done a bit of laundry, so now I'm in car care. And a bit of laundry, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and how old are you? You look about 12. Uh, 25. 25. So um, you're at the early stage career, but master's level chemistry is, is pretty serious, isn't it? I mean, there's lots yeah. of lots of writing and things like that and exams. Yeah, lots of lab work as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in this lab that you were you were given kind of carte blanche for us to design your own lab in its new premises, which is really cool, I would imagine, from yeah. your point of view. Um, and you got to say what toys you wanted. Sorry, scientific equipment that you needed. Yeah. Um, to carry out the job. Now, what is it that you actually do here from, from a Valet Pro point of view? What, when you come in on a Monday morning, I mean, does Greg run in and say, right, I want you to build me this, and then you've got, you know, X amount of time and these products to do it? Or how is that basically what it is? Pretty yeah. much. You just sort of <laughs> runs in, oh, I've got an idea. Yeah. Um, so, and you're concocting it, what's really interesting, from the ground up, it's not just taking in, you know, pre made detergents and sticking them together, putting in a different smell and saying, Bob's your uncle. You are actually doing the formulation from dot. Yeah, so start from scratch, uh, basically try to try as many ingredients as we possibly can. Uh, so basically, for example, a snow foam, we might make 50 to 100 different snow foams before. We're actually happy with it. That's cool. Sounds like me cooking. Always trying to put paprika, <laughs> yeah. paprika into things and it never goes well. Um, and um, you are currently in the process, in the middle of a year, where you're trying to release, or you are releasing, one product a month, which I imagine is a massive ball egg. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work indeed. <laughs> and you're single crew here from a chemistry point of view? Uh, so I have support from our house with the compliance and everything, but otherwise the actual making the formulations, yes. So if there's a product you really like from Valipro, he's the man, and if there's a product you don't like from Valipro, he's also the man. So um, what we're going to do is show, you mentioned the compliance stuff, now you do some of the compliance stuff, don't you, in terms of just the yeah, prep? the actual testing of it, yeah. Yeah, and we're going to demonstrate this. So behind you we have a, I'm going to call it a flash meter but that sounds fairly naughty, doesn't it? So what would you call it? A flash point meter. A flash point meter, that's much, much better and more legal. And um, the idea of this is, if you've got a chemical um, and it will be at certain temperatures, you basically measure the temperature at which it becomes flammable. And if that temperature is below a certain threshold, which in the UK is? Uh, approximately mid 65 degrees. 65 degrees. If it goes pop, basically, to an open flame before, or at temperatures below that, then you have to put a flammable badge on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have the big flame symbol on the back label. Which cause panic to people. So a lot of people, a lot of car products, probably don't have the right thing because they haven't been put through this test. So it's something that's kind of good to see, um, you know, products that are being tested properly before they're being put out to the public domain. And in here, we've put a mystery product, but it is a product yeah. that people use on their cars not saying who it's made by or what's for or anything like that, but it is a product out of a bottle, mm. and we've cooked it up to 80 degrees. Yeah, so well above the flammability rate. Well above, and is this product normally come with a flammable label, or is it? Uh, no, it would come about the classification, so it meets that mid-60 requirement. Gotcha, so if you've got this chemical at 50 degrees, and you hold the light to it, it's not going to be a problem, but okay. have at 80 like what we've got, and open it to a natural flame, <laughs> well, let's see what happens. Okay. So we've already got it set at 80 degrees, so what we're going to do is add a sample of the product. Uh, we'll start a flame running and we'll wait for 30 seconds. And after that 30 seconds, we will introduce a flame to the product. And if the product is flammable, then it will basically flash. And then you'll see here in big letters that it says flash. flash. And it tells us that the product will light at this temperature. So it's flammable, basically. So in brief, it's like a little dot on the right hand side is a little oven, you put the liquid in there, heat it up to temperature and you've got a trap door that you pull and if the yeah. ethers go up and then it's going to go pop. Yep, yeah, basically. Let's see what happens. I'm loving the syringe as well. So I'm going to start the countdown. So again, because that piece of equipment, what it does is once you put it in, you press a button, it counts down I think from about 25 or 30 or something like 60 that. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. And um, then a little peep peep happens, and then uh, Josh will open a little trap door um, where there's a flame that you see he's just setting up now, and um, that will essentially expose the uh, what do we call it the, the the spirit of the chemical, I guess. Yeah, butane. The butane to to the um, to the popper. So I need to make sure the flame is the exact size for the test as well. Yeah. Be careful to not breathe into it because then the flame will go out. 
and what was interesting, this piece of kit, it looks very clever, it's obviously lots of fun, but it's not all that expensive. We reckon it's probably under a grand um, for something like that, whereas some of the other equipment here is worth rather well, more than that. Which is coming up. Is it here it says flash. It's uh, flash. Did a little flash on the insides of the product actually set a light and oh, okay. the crack the, the trap door shuts and then you close the oxygen to the thing and then it's not so with out so yeah. you know, just bringing down a nice new lab. So that is a brief guide to a flashpoint and as I say in the UK it's around 60 odd. Um, so if it doesn't go pop before 60 degrees or above, then you're okay, you don't need the label. And then in America you were saying it's even harder. Yeah, 90 something degrees. Crikey, so you've got to find a product. If you don't have the flammable thing on, it means that you can cook it up to 90 degrees and, and it still won't go pop. So that's that's quite difficult, I would imagine. So I imagine more things have flammable batteries going to America. Yeah. Gotcha. So having played around, sorry, tested the flash meter, um, we thought it would be a good idea to talk about the new products that are on the horizon. So um, by the time you're watching this, these products will have been released, mm -hmm. but at the moment they're unreleased, there's very secret information. Josh, tell me what, you're saying there are three coming out, what are those three and what do they do? So we've got a convertible roof cleaner called Drop Top Cleaner, convertible roof protector called Drop Top Protector, and we've got a liquid wax product called Indulgence Cream Wax. Dungeon screen wax. Is that a polymer wax or is it a? Uh, uh, so it's yeah. using purely Canova wax. Uh, so it's very easy to apply. You basically put it onto the painted surface. You don't need to wait for it to cure or anything. You just apply and then buff off the right away. Off yeah. stop. And what's the sort of durability on that? Uh, at least four to six weeks, but depending on conditions, longer. So it's designed to be uh, easy to use, fun, kind of pleasurable to use. Yeah really good deep gloss I'm imagining mm -hmm, definitely. Um, and then at the price of durability but then frankly if you want to do your car every other weekend that's not a big deal is it? Um, and how long does Be Beading Marvellous or Pace Wax last? Maybe? Beading Marvellous will last for three months. So that's a much more um, durable product but again it's, it takes more effort to put on than a liquid wax would. Yeah so it's easy to use and you do, depending on the conditions you still can see protection after that same period as well but the idea is it gives you that level of protection that's worth much more than a quick wax or a quick detailer but at the same time it's easier to use than a standard So it's products. kind of almost like a show wax and that you can probably apply it you know mm -hmm. as a quick detail to car you can then apply it over the top to get yeah, that definitely, yeah. extra bit. Um, and the convertible top cleaner um, now I'm guessing that is for fabric and mohair and all the different yeah, types, all types of fabric. Yeah. And is it just clever detergents? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like it, I'm so damn honest. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the protector, is that a sort of, some sort of polysilane concoction or is that a totally different technology you're using? Or are you not allowed to say? I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> it's annoying. And how long, what's the protection on that? I'm guessing it's going to have some sort of fungicide in sort of thing going green. Mm, on the in the cleaner, yes. In the cleaner. Oh, in yeah. the cleaner. So you can get rid of it and then basically it will stop any sort of bacteria we're growing afterwards. Yeah, it will cover that sort of. And can it be applied? This is a big thing when doing convertible roofs. Is that if you've done a deep clean convertible roof with a lot of protection products, it needs to be bone dry before you can apply it. Now that's fine if you're a detailer with a garage and some heaters and stuff, and you leave it overnight, or a unit like that, you leave it overnight, and you can do it the following morning. But for mobile relatives, for people at home, you might not have that luxury. So does the protector have to be applied to a clean roof? I mean, to a dry roof? Uh, so what we have on the label is we suggest that you lightly spray it with some water to allow it to better spread when you apply it. Uh, so after application you simply spray it on, but ideally you want to leave it in a dry environment afterwards to cure for essentially overnight, but to get the most out of it, it will still work just as well if you apply it outside. So it actually encourages a soggy surface for you to, to apply it on and then you need to leave it in the dry to cure, which makes sense, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm guessing longevity depends on how many times you pull the roof up and down because yeah, that's definitely, what yeah. breaks stuff down. Yeah. And I'm guessing you're targeting a sort of fabulous or gold sort of territory in terms of product longevity as a kind of benchmark product. Yeah, there. basically. So that would be an interesting one. I'm looking forward to seeing some testing on that. If I had a convertible, I would do some testing myself, <laughs> but I don't. Um, and so those are the three products. Now what I wanted to know is, when you're developing a product, when, when Greg bounds in with all the energy on the Monday morning saying, right, I want you to develop one of these, what genre of products do you most enjoy developing? Uh, so I think what I enjoy doing most is the products that are quite easy to use, generally speaking. I thought you were say easy to do. No, no. <laughs> if you want some water, great. <laughs> so, um, okay. so for example, indulgence, like you notice that it's a lot easier to use than a traditional wax. I think they're the kind of products that I enjoy making the most just because you feel like you're bringing something to the market that 
basically helps your customers to get the kind of performance. Uh, okay, so yeah. it's a kind of a job satisfaction side. Yeah. And what I mean, what sort of products can you use the fun stuff on in terms of the equipment and the chemicals? Because I've seen what you can't see here is there's a big uh, kind of line of, of bottles with raw ingredients in, and I have had a little peek, and there's some very exciting sounding chemicals. I have no idea what they are, but they're very exciting sounding. I mean, what is the most kind of? Um, I mean, are there any products that are a little bit dangerous to develop? Perhaps? Uh, no, I wouldn't say they're any particularly dangerous. So what I try to do when I make products is make stuff that is environmentally conscious. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff I use is quite safe, made from renewable resources. I don't really want to be using stuff that if a customer's breathed it in, then they're going to start fainting or anything. So that would be I try to avoid yeah. that kind of ingredients. And, and environmentalism is a serious thing to consider. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm massive environmentalist, which is why I've got a manual gearbox on my car to run an automatic because of purely environmental yeah. reasons. Um, and when you're developing a product, are you've got one eye, I imagine, on um, not just what you're allowed to put into these products, but yeah. what kind of from a moral responsibility you should be putting in there. Um, in the olden days, which obviously you don't remember, but in the olden days, some car products were quite dangerous and they had some quite nasty bits in there, quite nasty solvents. Yeah. And I think there are still a couple out there where they're still using the same solvents. It, can you give us an example by name of a active ingredient or some description, maybe something like a tolerine or something like that, in, in a uh, genre of car care products? that you're not allowed to use anymore or that you shouldn't use anymore because of environmental or safety issues? Yes, definitely. Um, for example, um, our citrus tar and glue remover. Yes. Uh, traditionally, tar and glue removers will use harsh chemicals like toluene within it to remove the tar from the car, which is quite hard to get rid of otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're quite happy with our formulation in that we use a, it's technically not a solvent, but it acts like a solvent and is made from renewable resources. So you get the exact same level of performance as you do from a standard solvent. It's a little bit more expensive for us, but it's much better for the environment. And when, when we say this, because quite often people kind of regard, and I think rightly so, that citrus is kind of a, a level stronger than a detergent, but not as strong as a solvent when it comes to cleaning power. How does citrus work? When people say citrus, is it the same product? Because I mean, there's obviously a, a, a connection with citrus acid, citrus acid and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, what is citrus? Uh, so citrus could mean a lot of different things. So the key um, ingredient that people associate with citrus would be delimonene, yes. which is basically um, it, you get it in lemons. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, it will act like a solvent, and um, it's not. A f we used to use it within our citrus tiring to remove it, but we moved on to another, even more environmentally conscious product since then. So we've kept citrus within the name, and it still has that citrus smell to it that people are familiar with. What well, is citrus good at? Because, for example, um, the old debate about panel wipe. Some people say panel wipe just use IPA and it's fine, but panel wipe um, is actually a combination of different things. From what I'm told, at least good panel wipe is. Um, in terms of and the reason that being is that IPA will break down certain things. I can't remember if it's waxes or oils or something that IPA is really good at breaking down, but there are other things that it's not so good at breaking down. So IPA will break down waxes and oils. Uh, panel wipe isn't something that we. Don't do it, yeah. 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 But I'm sure it'll be on your list. <laughs> I can see the door opening with great yeah. power in the end. Saying, right, maybe panel wipe. Um, and um, so the citrus is, is generally, is it, it is generally speaking, a milder solvent than something like toluene and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I want to see some more of your toys. Okay. Um, so we're going to go and have a little play with toys, and uh, I'm sure you'll see some B-roll footage of, of what they do and how they work. Now we are just going around having a poke around the Valet Pro lab and we've got a special fridge here. Now I presumed this was for Josh's Diet Coke and, and your vodka and stuff like that, yeah. um, but apparently not. What are you hiding in your fridge? Uh, so with everything I test, we want to make sure that it's still at the same level of quality so it basically doesn't separate into two separate ingredients or how many ingredients there are in there. So what we do is we'll leave it into a fridge at five degrees. So this sort of mimics the kind of environment it might be in, whether it's in someone's garage in winter or in certain countries, it's a lot colder. Mm -hmm. And it's just to make sure that the products stay exactly as they were made when they were manufactured. Gotcha, and you've got another one for the same purpose in hot Yeah, exact same purpose. Yeah. Brilliant, well, let's have a look. Okay. So Quacky, you've got a bit of a collection in there. Yeah. Um, do you want to pass me something so I can talk about it? Yeah, so. This would be a stability test for our new snow foam product that we released last month. So you oh, can yes. see a date on here as well. Formula One, Formula One, it's already come up. It's, it's a clever, yeah. clever one. So this is stability <laughs> test, four degrees, and you've put it in on the 24th of the 1st of 2018. Mm -hmm. So, so I think this would have been in the... So that's um, 2018. 
Yeah, maybe that was a... That's impressive, yeah. impressive testing. I did that and <laughs> I didn't update the year on the label, but yeah. either way, um, it's, a, it's a very appealing colour as well. And so from this, this is quite a thin liquid, isn't it, the snow foam? Mm -hmm. And um, if it had failed the test, you would have seen separation in here? Yeah, definitely. So what you usually get is, if there's a lot of cleaning products within it, it will go cloudy. Mm -hmm. So you'll get a cloudy layer on the bottom, which is denser, and then a more clear layer, which is mostly just the water on the top. Gotcha. So if you would find with a lot of products where they do have this separation, then they would then suggest to shake the bottle before we're using it. And you were saying so we're trying to yeah, make products where that's that not even necessary. Yeah. And what you were saying, I remember earlier, is that products that do separate, because I, I never saw a big problem in separation. Visually, I can see it's difficult. Let me give yeah. you that back so you're not cooking your fridge. Okay. Um, and uh, I always just presume, well, you shake it, and actually, if you've got lots of different components in a in a given product, and they are going to separate, that's a fact of life. And frankly, you know, we should be able to cope with that sort of thing, given yeah. the other hardships that we have in real life. However, Josh here was like, nah, it's lazy chemistry. You want to have something, if it's separating, it's lazy chemistry. That was your kind of approach to it, wasn't it? Yes, basically. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the arrogance of youth. Anyway, um, the great thing about all of these different bits and bobs is that you're all kind of in control of it all, which is really nice. And you've obviously got a lot of things going through, with chatting off camera about the new products you're developing and how you've got to kind of go through these different hoops to make them and how you literally, when concocting something, you're trying to put as much, trying as many different things as possible. Yeah. And it really is kind of pioneering stuff, dare I say. Yeah, so we go from the ground up, so we will have a set of ingredients and then we'll bring in lots from various suppliers raw materials to test and then we'll see what combinations work best. Uh, obviously there's different factors that you have to think about project to project, so mm -hmm. how you'd want the customer to be able to use it, wherever it needs to be easy to use in the sun, for example, that sort of stuff. That's what's up. I mean, are you a petrol head yourself? Do you test these yourselves or do you just hand it over to the, the team Valet Pro detailer to have a play? Uh, so I do a lot of um, testing with the Pro Valetor as well, so he does most of the testing for us, but obviously I want to see myself if the products are working. Another thing that Josh wanted to show me was about, uh, well, essentially involving these plates. So Josh, tell me what these plates are about. Uh, so with a lot of the harsh kind of products that you want to make, so for example, with a wheel cleaner, there's a lot of brake dust that you want to try and remove, so therefore mm -hmm. you have to use harsh chemicals. Uh, what we want to make doubly sure is we're not producing a product that is particularly harmful to the metal or alloys behind the wheels. You get to that situation where I've got good news and bad news for you. Yeah. The good news is <laughs> the fallout's gone completely. The bad news is you need to refurb your wheels. So yeah, no, it's, a, it's a big issue. So you place, uh, uh, I imagine you spot test some of the, the, the Dragon's Breath. So it's completely immersed. So okay. these tests would have been tested with a product like um, Bilbrey Wheel Cleaner, so a mm -hmm. highly alkaline product. So what I'm trying to test is making sure that we can make a product that isn't corrosive to metal. So there's certain standards that you can meet so the level of corrosion, if it's below a certain parameter, then technically it's not corrosive to metal. I see, from the point of view of labelling as well. Uh, yes. Because I hate to break it to you, but I can see where you put the chemical. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you put this in an oven? Uh, so you have to control it at a set temperature, which off the top of my head is 50 to 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you're supposed to leave it for an entire year before you actually work out what the corrosion rate is. So the rate that the metal actually corrodes from the well, plate. Can, I'm guessing you put it in for a couple of weeks and then you can extrapolate. Yeah, so there's a minimum standard that you have to meet. So that is uh, basically about a month that you'd want to do. So that's like the kind of advanced weathering that you get on waxes mm -hmm. where they say, oh, we know all, all coats yeah, are things when they said, we know it last 10 years, but hang on, you've only started this six months ago, and that's how the bike acceleration thing. And is this aluminium or is this steel? This is steel. That's aluminium. Oh, it's aluminium. Mm -hmm. um, and these two, are there, is there any difference between the two of them, or have we just got two for having two? Uh, no, so they were both tested with a standard, uh, highly outlined book in it that you can find on the shelf. <laughs> and, what's, and what's really interesting is, as again talking behind the scenes, is that um, Greg didn't want you to test other products not made by Ballot Pro. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a lot of manufacturers, I've been to a lot of labs, and a lot of them have tons and tons of bottles of competition. I found one or two bottles here for benchmarking by the looks of it, but the reason they didn't want you to test other things is so that your creative inspiration isn't tainted mm -hmm. by what's already on the market. And that's a really, really interesting approach. I like that approach because a lot of chem chemical companies out there will say, oh crap, you know, there's product X and we've got to develop something to compete with it. So they test product X and then work out how they can make their product Y that little bit better. So you're literally blank slating it, which I think is really, really cool. Yeah. And fully legitimate reason for having a proper lab all of your own. Yeah, but we just tried to focus on what we think our customers want. So we want to make a product that 
yes, it might be less corrosive than a capacitor's product, but we want to make it actually hit the standard where it's just not corrosive at all. Gotcha. <laughs> and actually, as, as, as yeah. Greg was saying, it's big into the idea of problem solving. I think from yeah, his background as a mobile power yeah. yes, is knowing what an issue is and that it needs fixing and to what extent it already can be fixed by current products, but finding mm -hmm. an alternative way of doing it yeah. is always worthwhile, which is why some of the products are, are so different from other products out there. Yeah. It's good to see. Anyhow, let's go and find some more toys to play with. For our next instalment of playing in the lab, sorry, testing important equipment in your lab, um, we've got a magic magnetic spinny thing. What's this do? Uh, so when you're doing lab uh, testing, so you're only making small amounts of a product, you don't need to use the large mixing equipment. Uh, so what the magnet does is it allows you to stir a product, uh, basically without having to use any like heavy mixing materials. So basically, can if I, I press it, can I have a play? Yeah, sure. Materials. Sorry, I just I like playing with these things. So which one do I press? Uh, the right one. The right one. So this one actually heats it and stirs it at the same time. So that's saying stir at 1300 RPM. It's very quiet, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and how fast are we allowed to turn it up? I mean, it goes up to 1,500. Is that a good idea? Yeah, it should be fine. Yeah, I'm pressing there in the whirlpool. And what we've got here, so I'm going to back off now, press the button because I'm happy. I'm sorted for the whole of today. Um, what we've got here is obviously two dyes, mm -hmm. and it's like primary school, and yeah. we're going to be able to mix the dyes to create a colour. Yeah, basically. And if you mix red and blue, you get green? Purple, I think. Purple. I was never very good at this thing. <laughs> um, now, what I'm going to do is turn this down because now it's making a gurgling noise. So let's turn this down to um, something sensible. God, it's like real life science, isn't it? <laughs> um, we don't need to heat it up. Should we put it? Oh, you've got pipettes, haven't you? That's terribly mm -hmm. sensible. This has absolutely no practical purpose whatsoever apart from just doing it. Now, I was talking to a chappie called Dr. John Hogg, and he was saying how with waxes, dyes, how many drops? As many as you want. Hey. Um, that dyes can actually impact the performance, that's a nice colour, the performance of a product because they actually make an impact on the, on the light, how, it, how it operates. Is that the same for liquid dyes and liquid products? Uh, so the dyes that we use are food based. Okay. So they're like super safe. So for so example, you know, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, like you could almost drink it if you wanted to. <laughs> but I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> But, uh, so it's the kind of stuff where the idea is if it gets on absolutely anything that can be easily removed, like it solubilizes instantly in water. Okay. And I'm guessing, given how strong these are, and how, because you might be able to see the camera, it's completely opaque, um, you're only for a bottle, say if you had a, a one litre bottle of product, mm -hmm. you've probably only got one or two drops of this stuff in it. Yeah, and then this is already diluted down to 5%, so... Blimey. Are they really, really expensive, the dyes? Because I know in the waxes, some mm -hmm. of the dyes can be very expensive. Yeah, they're very expensive. That's key. Well, anyway, we have turned some clear water, a really attractive blue colour, and then I've managed to make it a slightly unattractive purple colour. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm set for life now, I'm good, I've achieved it, I'm, I'm, I'm retiring. Great. Um, <laughs> and these are, are these, are they expensive pieces of, of toys, of kit? Uh, not particularly, so a mixing equipment, for example, one of these will set you back £80 pounds approximately, That's I think. Back, even with a built-in heater? Yeah. Cool, cool. Okie okay, dokie, so we've done that one. Um, what's this one next to it? Uh, so that one is a viscometer, so it basically measures the flow of a product, so basically how thick it is. Uh, so that's important in all sorts of products that we're testing and developing. And in a blue beta manner, we have a little box of tricks here already. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these little box of tricks here because I know that that camera's looking at that already, so it's okay. multitasking. Um, and uh, these are, you were saying, for different... Levels of thickness, viscosity, yes. Brilliant. And, and could we demonstrate how any of this works? Can I take up more of your time? Uh, we could demonstrate it. I'll take a little bit to set up. A little up. bit of set up? Okay, well, I'll tell you what, we will do some cut footage of this running just to show people how okay. it works. But basically, I'm guessing it sort of spins around and then gives yeah, it resistance. Basically, yeah, basically. That's cool. That's cool. So it's giving you a measurement in dynamic viscosity, mm -hmm. which is basically the flow rate of a liquid against the surface. Cool. And, and that unit's 10120? 
so that would be sort of the typical value in Centerpoix for a product that's quite thick like this. So this is an example of a level so leather soap product. No. Well, Josh, thank you so much for uh, spending so much time with me and all my stupid questions. Yeah. Um, and we will continue on. I believe we're going to the warehouse next. Okay, great. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs>